Hello and welcome. My name is Adrian Ellis and I'm the chair of the Global Cultural Districts Network and I am moderating for the next half hour a discussion between three highly experienced pa panelists, discussants on the topic of public spaces, their safety, their accessibility and their sustainability. The three, uh, my, my three uh, uh, panelists are uh, Ilana Altman, Lana is the co-executive director of the Bentway in Toronto, uh, a fascinating experiment in a, in a cultural district and a public space. Laura Capobianco, who's a policy specialist in safe public spaces uh, and works with the UN. And Monica Ramirez Hartman, an author and activist and a civil rights attorney in Bogota, who has done a lot of work on the cultural district, the Bronx cultural district in, in Bogota. And our topic is, is, I think, one that uh, everybody recognizes as timely, which is to, to think about whether when we address public spaces, their accessibility, their, uh, uh, their, um, uh, their safety, whether we're addressing them through an appropriate lens of uh, equity uh, 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 and an appropriate lens uh, to reflect what should be higher standards in many ways about what we expect of our public spaces. And I'd like to ask them initially all the same question broadly. And that question is, is what should our expectations of public spaces be? And uh, what, what are the principles that inform your approach to the planning and to the management of public spaces? And how do you apply those in the context of your own work and your own projects. And if I may, uh, Alana, um, uh, I'll start off with you and the context of the Bentway in Toronto. And please tell us enough, you know, tell us, uh, tell us something about the Bentway so that we can contextualize that question. Yeah, ha happy to, and, and, you know, thrilled to be joining this panel and to have an opportunity to learn from everyone here today. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Bentway, we are an organization that's dedicated to the creation of civic spaces and civic experiences that provoke the urban imagination. And we're anchored, ours is anchored in a new type of public space that exists under an active elevated highway that stretches across the downtown core of Toronto. Um, I think that over the last couple of years, we've, we've fundamentally changed the narrative on what purpose infrastructure serves and for whom and shifted away from quite a singular debate about whether the structure stays or go to a much more nuanced debate about how we demand more from our infrastructure, both physically and socially, and how we search for hybrid opportunities that can serve both our physical and, and social needs in the city. Um, and we're a very young organization. We opened in January 2018 and you know, had just barely had two years of operation before COVID hit. Uh, and I think that it was a very interesting moment for us because we were simultaneously building the foundation for this project while also um, you know, reckoning with the fundamental questions of public space, um, its safety, its accessibility, um, the challenges that the global pandemic had posed, the, the uh, equivalent shadow pandemics that uh, were facing so many of our cities and the social injustices that were playing out in in public space. And so even though, you know, we were, we were still finding our own way, it felt like a really necessary exercise to question our foundations as well. And what I appreciated about the way that this talk was positioned and, and something that we feel, you know, quite strongly about is that our public spaces are predicated on social contracts, largely unwritten social contracts. But public spaces can only exist in the way that we choose to care for each other and we choose to care for our shared spaces. And what I think became all too evident over the last two years is that without a real commitment to safety and accessibility, there is no possibility of a broader social contact, uh, social contract. So we really took the time to reflect on what our definition of public safety was and, and who it was for and knew that we didn't want to go through that exercise behind closed doors. It's not the way the Bentway works. We're an organization dedicated to public space and publicness, and it felt very important to have that conversation in an open, transparent way alongside our artistic collaborators, community activists, policymakers, community members, 
So we embarked in um, quite a large scale initiative uh, that took the form of public art projects and editorial pieces, community surveys and um, online experiments. And hopefully uh, we, we can post that link in the chat, the, Sa the Sa Bentway Safe and Public Space link. What we learned that we were doing as we were doing it was effectively building a, a live toolkit in real time. And the dialogue with these partners allowed for the messiness of the conversation and often, you know, quite contradictory understandings of what safety meant and for whom come to light. Um, but for us, it was a fundamental opportunity to reevaluate our organizational practices and priorities. And I think that the implications are much broader than the Benway. And I think, you know, what we ultimately learned is that without this foundation, without this broader understanding, um, the publicness that drives public space isn't really possible. So, so just, just expand a little on, on the process by which, as you say, different, different sets of expectations, sometimes contradictory or conflicting sets of expectations. How do you, how do you ascertain those? And how do you, how do you create some sort of consensus? And what does that consensus mean in practice about the operation and management of, of, of Bentway's public spaces? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm an architect by background and I am now working in operations for the first time. And that has been a tremendous learning lesson because I think what was became very apparent to me in taking on this role at the Bentway is that public spaces are not made once. They're made every single day in the decisions and interactions that we have with the general public. And that's why, um, you know, fundamentally, I don't think safety is something that can be designed. It can only be enabled and why the governance of our public spaces and the models that we build together are so essential. Um, and so I, I actually don't know if the conclusions and, I, and it's misleading to say conclusions because I don't think that's ultimately where we arrived. I mean, it, it was not a singular set of recommendations that we that we came to necessarily. Um, but I don't think it's about consensus building. I don't think we're trying to build a condition that serves everyone because I think that's a false premise. What we need to be able to develop both in terms of our spatial propositions and our governance models is flexible systems and spaces that can serve different constituents differently. Um, and you know that comes down to uh, very fundamental physical decisions in terms of light levels and visibility, but it also really comes down to the programming and the way people see themselves reflected in public spaces, it comes down to the ways in which those public spaces, um, the rules that govern them and how flexible those are and how they're communicated and whether we're taking a position of do not as, as the fundamental pre premise for how we interact in public space or or it's more please do inviting people to make it their own so um for us i think what we really what we really learned is that um it's about the day-to-day -day operations it's about the way that we support communities that are on our space in, in quite a personal way that ultimately helps to create more safer and accessible environments laura you have a particular focus, I think, on, on gender and public safety. Uh, and uh, as I understand your work, uh, it is uh, it overlaps heavily with Alana's in trying to in trying to address the underlying dynamics of what makes spaces safe and welcoming and um, and our neglect of that in the context of many public spaces. Can you can you um, uh, uh, tell me a bit more about or tell us a bit more about the principles and uh, a philosophy behind your work? Um, thank you so much, Adrian. And on behalf of UN Women, the UN Entity for Women's Empowerment and Gender Equality, we really would like to thank the Global Cultural Districts Network for their kind invitation to this timely session. I think bringing on to this uh, discussion, I think it's very important that, you know, we recognize, of course, that violence against women and girls was a global pro uh, problem before COVID-19, and it's just been exacerbated. Um, and that obviously unequal gender power relations and discrimination against women and girls continues. 
in the COVID crisis, we of course saw this shadow pandemic of violence against women, both uh, in terms of domestic violence with um, lockdown orders, um, but also empty streets with fewer witnesses um, and women um, in public spaces, which continue to face, who continue to face heightened levels of sexual harassment and other forms of violence against women. And so, you know, for UN Women, we've been working for over a decade on uh, safe cities and safe public spaces global initiative. It's a very dynamic program with local governments, women's rights organizations, UN agencies, the private sector, to really ensure that this issue of uh, a barrier to public space, to walking safely to and from school, going to work, working in the nighttime economy, this barrier of sexual harassment that overwhelmingly affects uh, women experience and all their diversity, um, perpetrated by men often, um, that this issue gets taken care of so we can achieve sustainable development. So the issues of sustainability, accessibility and safety are well entrenched in this initiative where local governments co-create uh, with uh, women's rights organizations and NGOs um, and other partners, um, you know, to better understand the issue as it affects women and girls in neighborhoods across the world. Um, they collect local data, they inform the program, so evidence-based principle, human rights-based principle, looking at interventions that are needed um, that affect all of the rights of women and girls, the right to safe access to uh, water, recreation, uh, education, work, etc. Um, in terms of, you know, what we've been able to see is that how important it is to support women's rights organizations, women at the table in the co-creation of this work, in the design of safe public spaces. Um, and we have very concrete tools we've been able to share through our websites um, that enable this because local governments do need that technical accompaniment uh, to vamp up their efforts. During the COVID crisis, because we have 54 cities working in over 32 countries in this initiative, they have been able to um, immediately get the message out about the escalation and violence against women. They've been able to support within their, you know, decentralized functions, uh, the provision of shelters for women, um, getting women connected online to access uh, services. Um, and again, much more can be done in, the, in this effort. Um, but we've seen the importance of high political will, unequivocal leadership to drive this change, um, and also the importance of tools to accompany them to support their efforts. Of course, this means that within the uh, COVID response plans, whether they're at national level or local level, the integration of ending violence against women has been key, and we've had several cities work in that spirit. We've had cities um, further increase their municipal budgets to support women's safety action in public space, for example, in Ecuador and in Colombia. Um, and we have uh, six participating cities in Canada as well that are dedicating their efforts uh, to this work. So in your, in your work and experience, where is the balance between design and management and in management uh, uh, Lana talked and I, I'm sure Monica will talk too about the consultative processes that change people's attitudes to and sense of ownership of spaces and as that happens change what is regarded as uh, as acceptable behavior who believes that they are their spaces etc can you can you uh, tell us a bit about how the sorts of tools that realistically uh, or, or pra practically can be brought to bear to change people's perception of what is legitimate use and for whom of public spaces. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is this is work that has to be done. Um, there are several issues. First of all, that even to recognize that sexual harassment is a global problem was a barrier. <laughs> um, yeah. Even to ensure that that would receive focus in the violence against women agenda 
um, we had to work on that. Um, in terms of co-creation aspects, it's from the design of the Safe Cities approach that we have created spaces, we have convened spaces. Sometimes it's the first time that partners have sat around the same table. Um, and so absolutely crucial to have the skills of listening, the skills of empathy, the skills of thinking through how can we create those spaces and where can we actually go and meet women's rights groups in their communities. Sometimes it's also about changing the location for those discussions to happen so that we have an even more even playing field um, for the work to go ahead. I think that if there is a collective ownership of defining the problem and from different points of view and different vantage points, you build trust in that. And there are therefore data collected on sexual harassment, um, those who work on it, those who work on urban planning, transportation planning, who can be brought along the way in that journey. Um, we have tools to support the development of this data, tools to accompany cities in participatory program design, uh, where you have different methodologies um, to invite those reflections and from differently positioned women um, with different you know, um, modalities and pedagogy for that too, in terms of drawing what a safe public space looks like and having that vision for where do we take it from here. Um, so I do think it's really um, about creating that space. It's really about working with partners who can help you do that. And it's also about fostering respect. When that happens at the local level, and we've seen that across our safe city programs, then the design and the interventions then spring from that. And the interventions could be very different. For some, the, you know, the, pro the problem may be situated um, primarily in market spaces or transport, which you know, have a set of partners that they would work with on that. Um, for others, it will be whole communities on streets in particular neighborhoods and for some the interventions have to be city you know intervent you know intervention site focused and some have to be you know citywide in terms of changing social norms around these issues uh, around community mobiliz mobilization efforts with different sectors who have a stake in addressing these problems but also um those that can increase awareness about about this global scourge through campaigns and we have situated a lot of evidence-based campaigns that play its role on the social norms work but also getting into schools very early to change um to change norms around violence against women and and the right, rights of women um before i before i turn to monica let me let me um say to our audience that if you have questions to the panelists, put them in the chat and uh, we will try. We have limited time, but we will try to get to them. Mo uh, Monica, um, uh, you worked on a, um, a, a fascinating um, transformation of, a, of an area of Bogota uh, and um, Laura's and Alana's um, comments on um, on uh, co-creation and uh, collaboration from from our earlier conversation be be preparing for this i was struck by the similarities in all three accounts can you tell us a bit about about the 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 participative element and how important that was to the work that you did in in the bronx absolutely thanks Eve. And i will address that from my former role as a public official leading a cultural sure. agency in um repositioning, let's say, this very dangerous, very rough area of Bogota. And I think all our cities around the world have areas that people avoid because of safety. They don't want to go near them because, you know, it's just not uh, a nice area to be around. And we had this huge challenge of transforming um, a large part of downtown Bogota, a couple of blocks uh, that had been kind of um, made non-available to people for about 20 years. So it was a very, very uh, cha big challenge. And I think part of uh, what we understood is that normally in, in cities as citizens, we, d we take public space as something that's provided as is. And we don't really challenge as citizens what can happen in, in public spaces. And I think that understanding uh, allowed us to actually invite 
people into the process of what should happen in that space that would, you know, uh, in the future become or is right now becoming uh, not only public space but also a creative district. So we had um, we had an advantage which was using culture and cultural programs as a means for activating that public space. And Colombia in general, but in Bogota specifically, and I think many of our countries and our cities use culture because it connects with people. And that's what we we really had as um, as an advantage in this process. It was not just infrastructure. Sometimes the decisions around infrastructure are very technical and they, you know, they leave out this element of how to um, make a space or public space or you know, infrastructure become alive. And really the only means of something becoming alive is through people. So we did involve um, the community, obviously the, the, you know, the very close community, what was happening around that neighborhood in particular, but um, we had a major challenge which was, which was also changing the citizen, you know, general, um, citizens of Bogota's perception around this particular area. So when you want to change people's perception, you really have to involve them. And we found that the only way was making them go there and seeing for themselves that something was changing or, you know, see through, I don't know, television, uh, social media. And the only way to, to actually make something happen, uh, that kind of tipping point, is when you can actually change people's attitudes and then behaviors towards that particular space. And I think so it was kind of a, an increasing uh, way of connecting with people until there was that change in attitude and behavior. And today this project, this has been going on for about four years right now. Uh, the other interesting thing is that regardless of changes in administration, and we all go through this in our cities and our countries, you know, sometimes a new government comes in and everything changes and everything is stopped and then we start new projects. Here, um, I think pu the public adoption of what was going to happen in that space was so strong that regardless of a change in administration, the, the project continues. And uh, obviously we had a, you know, there was a pause during COVID and pandemic and quarantines and all that. But once again, this is a very active public space through uh, something that is very, you know, close to people, which is, which is culture, which is our local culture, our music, our food, our art. Um, and I think that really makes sense for people because it's something they understand. It's, it's, it's a language that they can relate to. Uh, which is something that doesn't normally happen when projects are too technical, you know, and we have these public officials coming out and saying the importance and the transcendence of the project from very technical uh, standpoints and people can't really connect to that or can't relate. But when you do involve them in something that, you know, they normally do, which is consume art, consume music, consume, um, I don't know, uh, fairs and um, festivals and things like that, then it makes sense to them. And then they understand what is going to happen there and why it needs to happen in a certain way. Um, what, are the, uh, what are the enduring structures of governance for, 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 the, for the cultural district? And how, how is the community involved in, uh, in an ongoing basis? Not, not, not simply in, in, as it were, the heroic chapter, but in the, but in the more routinized chapter that follows. So I'd answer that on two different levels. In terms of governance, I think it's very important that the private sector is involved. The transformative projects in a city cannot happen without public-private partnership. Um, the public sector can uh, you know, put the resources in, the budgets, the, uh, the licensing and all these uh, necessary things, obviously, but there has to be private uh, participation absolutely so in terms of governments today this is a private part a public par partnership and i think that's the reason why it, it's working and in terms of community and their involvement uh, one of the elements that we that we decided to put into that specific project was leave one of the original buildings uh, intact everything else was demolished but that specific building has become kind of a cornerstone for uh, community involvement and that will turn into eventually into a sort of a museum more more a memory place to kind of remember what happened there and you know, t tell future generations but it is today being activated through the 
the neighbors, the, the local community, and their involvement is to make sure that this place is, uh, doesn't feel foreign to them. And that's, I think, very important because you can't just implant something alien in, uh, you know, when you're trying to, to, to do these projects that really need um, involvement. And so today that space is being used almost on a daily basis through different activities, um, working with families, with children in that area. And every once in a while, there's a big event or a big um, you know, interesting programs that people from other sides of the city can, um, can go there and, um, and you know, get to know the place or enjoy what's going on. But, but I think it has to be, I, we always had this question looming in our minds, which was, okay, this is very easy to program for and to plan for on a Friday night or a Saturday evening, Saturday afternoon, but what happens on a Monday morning? And these places need to think what happens you know, on a Monday morning, when behavior and attitudes are different from what happens on the weekend, when you actually plan and go do something special. And, and I think that's kind of what's made this work is, it works on a Friday night, but it also works on a Monday morning. And it will, you know, that's the way it is conceived also in the future. Lana, I, I, there's, there's a question from the audience which was, what was the greatest challenge to invite people to gather under the Bentway at the beginning? In other words, well, there's no other words needed. At the inception, when there were probably considerable barriers, what, what um, was it programmatic? Was it consultative? How did you, how do you begin to break down barriers and, and bring people into that space? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree with Monica more on all fronts. Um, we, we have strongly believed from the beginning that programming plays a really essential role not, and not in just activating the space, but in continuing the, the larger effort to facilitate a conversation about transformation, about um, the ways that we want our cities to develop and for whom. And that's always been our approach. Uh, so I, I just wanted to, you know, second everything that you said, because it's, it's words that we live by uh, very much so. Um, I think the, the Gardner Expressway uh, was a very divisive structure in the city of Toronto. Almost immediately, as soon as it was built, uh, people were calling for it to come down. And it was built up along our waterfront and was really a, a physical barrier between the city to the north and the waterfront to the south. And the, the association in passing underneath it was, is that it was unwelcoming and unsafe. So there was a lot of barriers to have to overcome uh, in order to get people to see it through through new eyes. I think that a few things helped us. One, and, and again, to, to kind of echo what Monica is saying, this was a project that was built from a joint public and private agency. There was uh, philanthropic money that was given towards a public space project, which in Canada is actually not that common. Um, and I think it signified that there was a belief that this could be something more uh, and to a broader segment of the population. But that philanthropic money also allowed the project to happen really quickly. And I think that really benefited us in that there was excitement about the project. We were, we were building it in real time and welcoming the public in. When we opened our skate, skating rink for the first winter, we were still a construction site, but we didn't try to, we didn't wait until the project had come to fruition to welcome the public in. And as a result, I think the public felt very involved in the process throughout and have helped us to craft it over time. Um, so it, that helped, I think that worked to our advantage. Um, equally, I think it was really important to show the connectivity possibilities across this, this space. And so it's not an isolated section of the garden or it taps into other trails uh, across the city so that people are naturally finding this space anew rather than having to always come to it as a destination. And then lastly, absolutely, cultural programming has been key to our success. And with each uh, project that we present, each um, uh, performance and activation and public art presentation, we are able to build relationships with new communities and just grow the network of people who have embraced the Bentway and are, are making it their own. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask you all just one very brief question because it hasn't come up in this discussion, um, but I had thought that it might, and it comes up a lot in current discussion around the world 
around safety in public spaces. And that is, that is the potential tension between um, uh, uh, um, invigilation and surveillance. Um, and whether or not, um, as you look ahead, um, techniques of surveillance, AI, et cetera, which are being used in public spaces increasingly, not only to maintain or to, uh, not only to ensure uh, pub uh, public safety, but also for um, uh, reasons of monitoring. Whether, whether this is something that is currently on your horizon in the context of, of, of your work, and if so, how you see, whether you see dilemmas, uh, dilemmas in there ahead. Um, Laura, is this, is, does this figure in your, in your work at all? Um, thank you, Adrian. Uh, more broadly in the area of violence against women, we are working on safe technologies and also from the vantage point of violations can occur in public space and um, they can occur, you know, as well in online space. So there's the links around the continuum of violence and these are very important questions that you're raising and also the need again to have women's rights um, organizations and experts at the table with technology providers um, to to discuss these issues um, because again we could be putting um, those we're trying to engage uh, the most and um, uh, create uh, conditions of equality uh, we could be putting them in further harm so you know it's it's within a context of broader discussions um, and work being done with experts on the provision of safe technologies uh, and ending violence against women and girls monica dilemmas around surveillance i i think it, it's kind of inevitable in some places around the world ideally we would create situations where we don't have to get to that point but but i think it is absolutely inevitable i think our cities are more and more complex every day and um, we cannot ignore the fact that that will eventually be um more pervasive i think Alana, uh it, yeah. is, is it uh, i may i may flip the question slightly um, because I think that we have tried to avoid tactics of surveillance. What we are exploring is public data. And I think that public mm -hmm. data has its own safety risks and it's something that we have to be very mindful of the processes of collection and dissemination. Um, but I'll add a link to the chat. One of the projects that we supported through the Safe and Public Space Initiative was a project called Receipts by a wonderful um, collective here in the city, Public Visualization Studio, which is thinking about public data um, uh, throughout all of their work. And again, I think it comes back to how we allow, um, how we give agency back to those who are offering their data and allow them a degree of control over it, because it's critical information to allow us to understand what's happening in our city and where and why, um, but it can't be assumed and taken and controlled by a third party exclusively. So it was a pilot project that I think has incredible applications, um, you know, beyond beyond the installation that was up at the my site. Thank you. Um, this was a brief conversation uh, to be continued in chat forums and more generally. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful to the three of you. I was um, very surprised to know that you had not met one another prior to this occasion and given the overlapping the, the really seriously overlapping vectors of interest i i hope um i hope this session has has you know um initiated an ongoing discussion and i would love to be part of that discussion thank you very much indeed and uh, thank you for joining and thank you to uh, our hosts and um uh on behalf of gcdn the global cultural districts network uh, thank you very much indeed all three. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to the continued discussion. Thank you.